tweeting out the invitation to Joseph. Welcome. TD, welcome. Hi, you can call me Terry. Terry, okay, very good. I'll try and remember that. No guarantees. <laughs> I have several identities, and I have to use different names on Google. Anyway. No, no, I, I, I fully understand. That's that's okay. Um, I'm just saying I, I know that uh, from past experience, I tend to mouse over the picture to see the name to remind myself. Is so. my face as fuzzy looking to you as it is to me? It's a little bit fuzzy, but really not terrible. Uh, and I think that usually improves itself as time goes by. Okay. Camera has to my adjust that picture is, you know, my, my uh, monitor picture is excellent. And the, wow. Anyway, sorry. What's no, the no, topic no. of the day? What's that? What's the topic? Uh, I haven't actually uh, signed the topic today. So now, uh, I got from your, uh, from your title, Geology mm -hmm. Office geology office hours that yep. maybe we could come by and ask the professor a question. That is precisely what the original intent is. So All right. I interpret correctly. My guess. Let me just uh, point out before you go uh, to everybody that's that's on here, and I want to actually add a comment here in the uh, chat that I am recording this today. Uh-oh. So, um, I was never no here. Guarantee, no guarantee I'm going to post it, but I just want you to all be aware of that before you uh, launch into a screen against something. <laughs> In that case, my name is Bill. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we'll get that out. All right, so, Bill, <laughs> um, what, what's on your mind? What sort of question have you got? Um, lithium, the mineral. Yes. Well, lithium, um, the chemical element. Okay, yeah. That's, because that's... As, as a, it's a metal. I mean, as, as a chemical element, it certainly does occur in, in rocks, but, um, yeah, go ahead. Fire away. What about lithium? Well, we're hearing a lot about it, of course, you know, based on uh, liquid lithium reactors. Um, discussion about and also it. lithium batteries. I mean, Absolutely. And yeah. uh, predecessor to Paxil. Mm -hmm. I had the opportunity to visit a lithium mine some years ago. Uh-huh. Uh, well, I, a, li a lithium mine community. I didn't really mm -hmm. actually visit the mine, although the mine was just open, you know, uh, mm -hmm. scraping the surface off the desert. This was the Silver Peak mine uh, in the desert, in the mountains uh, between Reno and Las Vegas. Okay. And uh, I arrived there by helicopter, so I couldn't I couldn't drive to it today if I had to. <laughs> <laughs> Which is probably exactly what the intent was of the mining company. Well, it was it was very very remote or isolated and remote. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't think it's in operation anymore. Uh, I'm not sure about that. But uh, now, the town was small, and uh, the only place to hang out was the bar, right? Uh, this restaurant, and it was all you know raw wood, uh, you know construction, and mm -hmm. you know, very rusty. Sounds like this sounds exactly like a Nevada mining town. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I'm from Las Vegas, and I've been to many of them. Uh, but Silver Peak was was pretty unique. Now would. Uh, would people in Silver Peak have a uh, chemically induced uh, tendency towards calmness? Uh, I doubt it seriously unless the lithium was being dissolved in the groundwater. And I don't know how soluble lithium is, but actually, given where it sits on the periodic table, it wouldn't surprise me terribly if it was fairly soluble and, uh, and might actually be in slightly higher concentrations of the groundwater. Now, I don't know if those concentrations are anything close to the concentration needed for some medical effects to kick in. Sure. Uh, but it is certainly true that, um, you know, the geology of an area can have health effects. Sure. And usually that's via the groundwater because that's where you're, you're getting your most exposure to it. Yeah. Um, so I'm really not qualified to answer on the medical side of that. Are we uh, producing any lithium in the U.S. these, these days? Um, China has big stores of it. I, I, I suspect the answer to that is uh, no, not in large quantities. Right now, the biggest lithium producers that I'm aware of are, um, well, it, it's produced from evaporite deposits usually. Right, um, and we do certainly have some of those in the Western U.S., but uh, not the largest or most economical to produce from. I know that um, the Salar de Uni in um, South America, and I may be mispronouncing that, is an area that's in Bolivia, 
uh, the high Andean desert in the um, uh, what's the desert there? The uh, Atacama Desert. Okay. Um, right. That that is certainly an area that has been eyed for production. I don't know if there's any active production. I know there have been a number of test sites, uh, test you know edits or, or digs done there to to uh, measure its potential. Well, the high desert, the low test of Silver Peak would pass for a high desert in Bolivia easily. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. So. The answer to your question is, I, I'm not aware of whether we have any in the U.S. My my suspicion would be that um, as lithium becomes more and more strategic and becomes more and more uh, in demand, especially for batteries, sure. um, there's going to be more of a desire to develop uh, any areas that have potential for it. And my guess is that the, the best areas are probably outside of the U.S., and that takes into account not just the geology, but also the mining laws and the, the cost of operations. Well, clearly we need to go to war with Bolivia. Not necessarily. We could just buy them off. <laughs> um, it usually works in, in most places. So, um, yeah, but, I mean, it, it's it's not even just the U.S. I mean, this is clearly an area where the State Department does have an interest because, uh, you know, China would be just as interested as a as a major economy yeah, as that we would. Doesn't. Doesn't China have a large supply of lithium? Well, I, I don't know for sure, but certainly they have the right desert conditions to produce it. Uh, the, the Western Desert out there in, in Western China uh, strikes me as exactly the sort of region where you would tend to get lithium deposits. Now, have you um, seen have you seen the meme online today about uh, what's what's going on in China? These Google Earth blowups of some yeah, strange patterns. Yeah, one of those. Yep. That, that's the first thing that came to my mind is you know uh, exploring for. Uh, well, that that's the region. I mean, that's definitely the region. It's out there in that western desert, and it's yeah. it's it's a classic, you know, continental interior desert, similar in many ways, at least in terms of why it's a desert to the western U.S. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I would expect that the lithium. Now, what I, what I'm not entirely sure about um, is in those evaporative deposits, the source of lithium. Uh, it's clearly coming out of granitoid rocks. I mean, lithium tends to be concentrated in uh, the last fluids to crystallize out of a magma. Um, it's it's uh, you find lithium bearing minerals in pegmatites, uh, and this is probably where some of the modern production is uh, is occurring. Although I don't know whether it's economical compared to these evaporative deposits, uh, but you know some of the lithium bearing minerals that are um, mined uh, in the modern day, uh, well, I, I don't know again about the modern day, but um, Brian, I think you're emitting a high-pitched sound there. I don't know if you can, it might be a little feedback. Maybe just mute yourself unless you're ready to talk. Well, Ron, listen, I thank you for the information uh, very much, and I'll defer well, to the next to question. Sure, well, let me just finish that answer real quick. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, the, the big Lithium mineral that I have seen in large quantities, uh, spodumene, it's lithium pyroxene, uh, where the lithium substitutes for what's normally iron or magnesium in the, in the pyroxene. And this generates some monster crystals in uh -huh. pegmatites. And um, it's certainly probably much more economical to mine this from a, a, an evaporative deposit than it is to mine it from a... Um, pegmatite like this just because of the the energy involved in, in breaking that rock out and crushing it up. Yeah. But I, I would suspect that some of these pegmatite deposits, which are mined for many other things that are also economically important, uh, probably uh, mine uh, spodumene if they have it for the lithium as a byproduct of the mining, if not necessarily the, the primary uh, ore. Um, and, you know, I, I, I've seen it in the field. Uh, there's a beautiful pegmatite in northern Wisconsin I remember visiting and there was a literally the exposure was just in the woods but there was a, uh, a spodumene crystal that must have been 10 feet long. Say that was uh, in just, northern Wisconsin? Yeah, yeah. This is, um, I don't remember the specific locality. I, I, know, but there's, I, I, I know there's an area of uh, the mid, that part of the Midwest, northern Illinois and Wisconsin that wasn't scraped clean by the glaciers and so that No, this is that. actually in an area that, that was clearly glaciated. Okay. Uh, this is up. Uh, this is up near Green Bay, near Marathon, not Marathon. Marathon's 
Where am I thinking? So somewhere up there in the north, northeast Wisconsin okay. region, and I believe it was associated with a, a shear zone or something like that. The pegmatite was injected into there uh, as a late phase thing. Probably not economical in that particular case, but it made for a nice visit for the mineralogy class. I'll bet. I'll bet. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank uh, you very much. Hey, great, you're, you're, great question. And feel free to hang around and, and ask more because um, I'm going to go refill my iced tea and listen to the next question. Your your call. Um, so who's next? Who else has a question? That was a good one to get started with. Nobody got a question. Well, that's okay. Uh, Brian, you know, I was thinking now, it may not have been feedback on your end. I think I was just seeing your picture on there because it was uh, the last person who had spoken before me. So you, you might be just fine to unmute. Hey, well, I'm unmuted now. Is it still doing yeah. it? I think you're okay. Um, are the rest of you seeing me talk when I'm talking? Yeah, okay, then it's, it's fine. Uh, it was just when you were getting on at first there, it seemed like it was taking over. So fire away, Brian, you got a question? Uh, I'm also just here to lurk. That's fine, that's fine. That's okay, that's what we like, and as long as we got spaces, we'll, we'll go with that. Well, I meant um, to say, when I came on, I meant to say first-time caller, first-time listener. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, this is the joy of being public again. Um, about three or four weeks ago, I had been doing these for a couple of weeks, and we've been doing them publicly. And one of these Monday afternoons, we had a group about this size in here, and then the last two people that joined the chat room were here to muck things up. They were just uh, crashers. Well, we and have they, now. Yeah, exactly. And, and so I've gone back to doing it publicly again. I, I really prefer it this way because I think we get more um, just interesting people coming in. And uh, not to say that the people who have been here are less interesting <laughs> because they're all interesting. Uh, let's see. Jim. Uh, yeah, the webcam. Oh, that's, that's beautiful. What are you using to do that, Terry? Oh, uh, Minicam. Many is this a win, uh, Windows machine or a Mac? Yeah, window, Windows machine. It's a freeware um, device that captures the stream and lets you put other stuff, special effects. I'm in. Write that one down so I can I can do something with that. In the yeah, it's many cam. Okay, very good. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I'm sorry. I was just going to go back to saying, you know, I, I, as far as you know, geology and the news, which is the other thing we generally discuss. Um, I haven't noticed a whole lot today, at least uh, nothing uh, spectacular new. Um, I know that El Hierro eruption off the, in the Canaries was actually um, showing up on the webcam a little bit. Hey, Kath, how are you? Hey, Kath, how are you? I'm well on yourself. Hi. Uh, doing fine. Nice to see you here. Nice to meet you. I'm hearing a little echo from you, but that's okay. It's, it's not uh, terribly nice. So. Um, have you got any questions? Uh, because right now we had one great question to start us off, and then everybody else is lurking. Well, um, um, an interesting topic. Okay. Well, I was just I was just mentioning the El Hierro eruption. Um, it's still going on off the coast of um, El Hierro. It, it's actually a submarine eruption, but I know that they have a webcam set up now. Uh, we've been talking about this on and off in this um, geology webinar for the last couple of weeks, based on the seismicity, because uh, they've got um, the um, they got the seismic stuff on the web as well. Do you have a link, Ron? Yeah. Put in the chat. Column. What's that? Well, I, in fact, I was just about to say I was looking for that link a few minutes ago, and um, Twitter is uh, giving me fail well, which is my my easiest way to find the link. So as soon as I get through to Twitter, I will try and dump it into the chat room. It's night there, so uh, you wouldn't see anything at the moment. Um, there was some some bubbling at the surface though. And um, I know they've had a couple of helicopter runs over it. I haven't seen any of that video yet, but I'm, I'm easily going to do it. So, 
Who else has got a great idea? Or a geology question or anything else along those lines? You guys want to get a geology 101 question for you? If nobody... Go ahead, far away. Don't call yours. So the Earth's been around, what, four and a half, four point seven billion years? That would be the geological understanding of it, yes. Right. Why haven't we cooled off like like Mars has? And I understand like the ratio yeah. of the surface area to the volume, but it still seems like rock conducts heat pretty well. <laughs> well, no, rock doesn't heat, conduct heat pretty well. In fact, rock why, conducts, have, why isn't it all radiated off into space at this sure. point? So, I mean, the, the, the short answer for this question is basically uh, there, there's two sources of heat. One is the original formation of the planet, all right? When uh, early in the solar system, you got this dust cloud, the solar nebula, and the, the various planetary bodies in the sun all basically condense out of that as a lot of dust accumulates under the force of gravity into a few, you know, larger bodies. And obviously, the sun is the biggest of those, and it gets most of the... Uh, mass. Um, of course, all that mass is moving, and so it's got kinetic energy initially, and then when it comes together, that energy is no longer kinetic. It's obviously stopped, or it may be still, you know, fluidly rotating around, but the fact is a lot of that energy is transferred to heat energy. And if that were the only source of heat on the Earth, uh, then yes, we probably would have cooled off to a point where um, we'd certainly be a lot less geologically active of a planet. Um, a larger planet, uh, something on the order of uh, Jupiter is, is, well, has that going on deep inside, uh, but would not have cooled off by this point necessarily. But the, the other important thing, and that was what uh, Lord Kelvin originally tried to, how he originally tried to calculate the age of the Earth by looking at heat flow and trying to estimate uh, how long it would take for the Earth to cool down to its current surface temperature. Uh, but what he was missing was uh, something discovered after he made that calculation, which is radioactive decay. And uh, radioactive decay, uh, particularly the radioactive isotopes, you know, uranium uh, or, or radioactive elements, uh, uranium, thorium, potassium, um, those uh, through their decay give off heat as well. And that heat in combination with the original heated formation is where our uh, ongoing heat is coming from. And, and the fact is that rocks are really poor conductors of heat, ceramics in general. I mean, this is why the space shuttle had ceramic tiles on the surface, was so that the heat would not be conducted as it you know, re-entered through the atmosphere. Um, so in general, what's happened is the early Earth, when it formed, would have had a great deal of heat. You probably had magma oceans something like 200 kilometers deep, maybe deeper than that. Um, but the surface would have cooled down relatively rapidly, being exposed to the cold vacuum of space, or at least the, the thin atmosphere between there and the cold vacuum of space. Um, and that forms your initial crust and uh, outermost mantle. And then, uh, you know, it does continue to cool down since that time, uh, but that actually acts as a blanket. As, as the crust solidifies, uh, that basically acts as a blanket that, that um, traps heat in the interior. So uh, the heat loss is actually much less effective uh, than what it might initially imagine. Now, there's three means of transferring heat out of the Earth. Uh, you know, this is basic physics. So you've got radiation. Uh, and certainly you've got that if you're ever near a, a glowing lava flow. Uh, any of you have been close enough to a glowing lava flow that you felt that? I have. <laughs> let, me, let me assure you, there is radiation. There is radiant heat coming off of that stuff, and it is hot. But, you know, how many lava flows do you have on the surface of the Earth in the modern day? Not very many. So as a means of losing heat, a direct radiation from uh, the Earth's surface is is relatively minimal. You've got conduction. Uh, conduction is basically just heat transfer through a solid, and in that case, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's certainly an effective way of getting rid of heat, but it's a very slow means. Again, rocks are not particularly conductive heat or electricity. Well, at least most, most silicate rocks are, are, are not particularly conductive. 
Uh, and then you get convection, and this is really what drives plate tectonics. All right, so the overturn of the mantle, the convection of the mantle, transfers hot material from deeper down in the uh, mantle of the Earth up towards the surface. Um, you generate magmas at the top of that whole sequence that transfers heat more directly toward the surface. Of course, they erupt and they form new oceanic crust, but that overall convection um, pattern is what, what's uh, the primary way that the Earth is releasing its heat in the modern day. <laughs> it's, it's I thought the, the radioactive effect. elements were relatively rare. There's, there's enough of them to... Yeah, yeah, they are relatively the rare, but yes, there's enough of them. And, and I, I think it's, it's an ongoing question. I've never really seen a satisfactory um, quantified answer to this. You know, what's the proportion of initial heat of the formation of the planet versus radioactive decay? Um, you know, I, I've seen estimates that suggest that they're sub-equal in terms of the total heat of the Earth now. I've seen other estimates suggest it might be an order of magnitude difference between them. Uh, but I don't even know for sure which one would be uh, more um, more abundant as a heat producer in the modern day. Certainly, one thing you can say is the radioactive heat production has slowed over time because early on you would have had much more of those unstable isotopes, uh, the radioactive isotopes, and of over time, those have decayed. I mean, I think it's uranium. One of the isotopes, uranium, has a half-life of almost exactly four and a half billion years old, and so it basically is. There's half as much of that parent isotope around as there was at the beginning of the Earth. So clearly, there's less heat being produced in the modern day, and and there will be less and less of that heat. Um, but yeah, it's a combination of those two, and and again. Uh, they aren't very abundant. Certainly things like uh, thorium, uranium are, are not abundant at all in the Earth as a whole. Uh, potassium is probably the most abundant of the radioactive ice, uh, parent isotopes. Uh, potassium is only a minor element in terms of the Earth's composition. The overall mantle and crust, it's something like the Ninth or tenth most abundant element in the in the crust, and that's not even entirely radioactive. So um, it, it's not by any means a large proportion of the Earth. Uh, but the heat generated by its decay is, is I guess, sufficient that uh, it, it does have a significant effect. Okay. And if any of you know better to answer this, feel free to chime in because I don't pretend to have a monopoly on the knowledge here. Brian, that looks like an old slide tray over your shoulder there on top of the filing cabinet. Is that a uh, slide viewer? That, I've actually, I'm in like our really old geology store closet. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of what it looks like. I have to say, the, the, the lovely cinder block construction, um, you, you need a good geologic map up on the wall there behind you. Yeah, um, I mean, we've got everything in here. That, that works too, uh, you know. <laughs> um, I, I like the animations. <laughs> yeah, it, it's nice and quiet though. So yes, it's kind of our, it's our TA office now. So gotcha. Yep, I'm familiar with those. Mm -hmm. Although mine was so full of rocks that there was isostatic rebound when I moved out. <laughs> So, don't do that. That pretty much answer your question. I mean, that, that's as best as I know the answer. But um, that, yeah, good. Uh, I appreciate it. Yeah, I, um, heat flow is one of those things that's a little bit more of a geophysical thing, not exactly in my wheelhouse. But um, okay. I mean, I did work on radioactive decay, or at least you know, in terms of age dating. So, it's not uh, not a totally foreign subject to me. Hello, Renato. How are you? Got a geology question for us? Okay. Fine, thank you. Okay. 
No, nope, nope. Just noticed that your geology hangout. <laughs> okay, good. That, that's fine. We're just we're answering questions as they come up and just talking about geology in the news. Otherwise, so if there's anything on your mind, just uh, speak right out. Otherwise, we're all kind of lurking together. Okay, I'll think about a question. I was going to suggest maybe the other thing to do, since not all of you know each other, is to just do a quick round of introductions. Uh, saying maybe who you are and where you're from, and uh, if you have any uh, specific geology background or not. I don't know. You guys feel up to that, or it, it's it, you know it's part of being social here. So Brian, you're on the top here, far away. Just tell us a little bit about yourself. All right. Um, well, I'm an undergraduate still. Um, just I have a trying to get my degree in geology, uh, have a minor in geography. Mm -hmm. um, still working at grad school options. I'm at Olivet Nazarene University right now. I don't know if you know Charles Kerrigan, but he's uh, he's one of my professors. Indeed. Um, and that's in Illinois, just south of Chicago. But uh, I'm originally from Houston, so this is my time in the Midwest these four Are you years. Are in an area that's been glaciated or not? You yes. Sound? You are. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm actually in a glacial lake. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, it's flat as a within, pancake here. Within the area of Wisconsin glaciation? Um, I'd actually have to check. I'm not sure if Wisconsin got all the way down here. Yeah, okay. So how close are you to um, Chicago? I'm about... Well, I, was, I think it's about a 45 to an hour drive. So yeah, that's that's borderline. I don't know exactly in that area where I mean the, Chicago itself was underneath the Wisconsin and ice slope, and I know that area gets very flat. I, I've driven that area a few times because I did my PhD at Wisconsin Madison, so um, I'm familiar with the region generally, but not well enough to to know specifically where that terminal moraine was. So, well, that's good to know. So Houston, what do you think about that? Hot, humid. What was that? What would you think about Houston? Hot, humid, lots of oil companies. Oh yeah, I I like it though. I mean, it's it's home for me. Born and raised there, so. How did you get inter interested in geology? Um. Well, I've always been an earth science person. Um. I was actually planning on doing meteorology, and I was uh -huh. looking at schools for that. And it kind of just came down to running out of time to choose a school, and I hadn't really submitted any kind of application yet, and uh -huh. this was one of the last schools still accepting. And okay. they didn't have a meteorology degree, but they had geology, and I mean, I, I actually feel more comfortable doing that now, so. That's good, that's good. I, I'm always curious to ask that question just because um, in my former role as a geology professor, uh, you know, recruiting uh, new geology majors was always one of those challenges because uh, most Places in the U.S. don't have geology in high school or earth science, except maybe back in eighth grade or something. And so a lot of students come to the university not thinking about doing geology. So I'm always curious, you know, kind of what path people end up taking to get there. But, yeah. Kath, you want to take the ball and tell us about yourself a little bit? I think you're muted, Cap. I don't know. I'm not hearing you. There we okay. go. Yes, better. Better? Yes. Better. Okay. Um, I'm originally from Libya, but I studied at um, the University of Cape Town. Um, now I'm in Queensland. I'm still in contract. Uh, I'm about a whole range of new rocks. I'm not used to such young rocks. They're all from the Triassic. The um, volcanics around and the like. Mm -hmm. Don't know really what to say. Um, I did my master's in um, stable assets. Yeah. I'm sorry, your audio is breaking up for me. Are, are the rest of you hearing me? Sorry. I don't know what to do with that, about it. 
could be the connection. It could just be the lag time. I'm not sure. But I was getting little bits and pieces of that. Okay. Well, feel free to uh, type something in the, uh, in the chat down there. It's down there, right? Um, just to, to fill us in a little bit. Doak, meanwhile, you want to take over? Tell us a little about yourself? Sure. Um, I'm in Richmond, Virginia. I have next to no theology background other than what I, the education I had in elementary school and middle school. So can I pause you for a second? Um, Kath, we're getting feedback. Maybe you can while you're while you're just listening. Sorry about that. Oh, okay. Yeah, so anyway, yeah, I'm located in Richmond, Virginia, and I think you know, I stumbled upon this hangout, I don't know, a month or so um, ago, just uh, I'm interested in geology, like, like I think I told you once before, I watch the Science Channel a lot. Mm -hmm. um, one of my favorite shows I've gotten, it's been on my DVR for probably a year, is how the Earth was was made, and it, you know, it goes through the whole geological history of the um, Earth. Um, I've, I've enjoyed your blog, by the way, and some of the postings of some of the other people in the Hangout here of, like, you know, pictures and places that they've been. And it just uh, reminded me about a, a year or so ago, I was, um, I'm a software consultant, and I commute to client sites quite a bit and was uh, working out in Portland, Oregon. Oh, gorgeous area. You fly uh, east to west, as you approach Portland, you know, Mount Hood is right there to the north mm -hmm. of the... Um, plane, and I got to the point where I always wanted to make sure I was sitting on the north side of the plane, just to marvel at uh, uh, Mount Hood, and I mean, it, you really get a sense for its scale and how uh, you know, huge a mountain that thing is, that you fly, you're basically flying right next to it, and you fly next to it. Um, you know what you would enjoy? Um, uh, Kyle House, uh, who also goes by the Twitter handle uh, Dr. Jerk, Dr. J-E-R-Q-U-E, D-R-J-E-R-Q-U-E. -E. Uh, he has a blog. I think it's, uh, I don't know if it's a Tumblr or a poster. So I'll try and, uh, I won't be able to dig out the link real quickly. But he just took a flight from, I think, Seattle down or Portland uh, down to uh, Arizona, I think maybe Phoenix. And so he actually, the first leg of his flight was flying right down the Cascades. And he had the oh, window yeah. seat. And he, he posted on, on this account um, uh, pictures of Mount Rainier, uh, Mount what was it Hood, and I think the Three Sisters. Uh, gorgeous picture, just just gorgeous. So uh, yeah, I, I um, you don't always get them in um, a cloud-free sort of day, but he, he had a good right. day to fly. No, I've been flying up there at night, and it was a while before I realized yeah you know, it was there. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, in one weekend, I, I spent the weekend there. I was looking for something to do, and it's like, well, you hear about Crater Lake in elementary school, so I rented a car one Saturday, drove. I don't know what it was, like yeah, three hundred so miles it's... there. Checked mm -hmm. it out three hundred miles back, but it was uh, that was worth the trip as well. Oh, that's that's well worth it. I, I love Crater Lake. Um, that's that's definitely worth doing. Although don't do don't try it during the winter. They've already closed the roads around the rim drive. Well, the funny thing uh, was, I went in May thinking that uh, I'd be all right, but there was still you know snow drifts. Oh, yeah. Uh, what so, if, there was only one road in. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I would like to do it where you can you know circle the. Rim, but, but yeah, I mean the scale of it amazed me, and the fact that it was active not that long ago in the tens of thousands of yes years. So. Mm -hmm. Even less than I think it's seven thousand yeah. years ago for the, the catastrophic eruption, and more recently for like um, Wizard Island. So yeah, that's a gorgeous spot. Neat. Um, Grizz, you want to give a shot? Uh, introduce yourself. Say hi. Yeah, no worries. I'm an undergrad. Just uh, started out on my few tentative steps down the road towards becoming a geologist, studying with the Open University in the UK. Um, I say I've only been doing it since October, just started my course, so it's very early days at the minute, 
But uh, yeah, getting there, loving every minute of it so far. It's quite a lot of work with what I'm studying at this present time because, like I said to you last week, Ron, the actual module, this first module is a, a very intense one. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a lot to get your head around, especially just coming into it. I mean, I've not studied now for, I think it's about 17 years since I, since I left school. So uh, it's, it's a lot of work and a lot to get your head around when you're just starting out again. Mm -hmm. Jim, I know you don't have audio there, but you're certainly welcome to, to type in the, uh, the chat there a little bit about yourself. I, you know, part of my reason for asking this is I, I, I met most of you before via Google Plus one way or another, uh, not all of you, but um, it's my hope that these conversations become ones where I'm not the focal point of the conversation necessarily, but each of you over time gets to know each other a little bit and, you know, begins to venture out and have your own conversation, maybe even your own hangouts. So um, I'm trying to draw the community together here rather than just simply becoming a focal point for it. So just want to be able to, you know, go and walk away from the uh, camera and have the conversation not come to a grinding halt. Hmm. Pennsylvania, Jim. What part of Pennsylvania? Allentown. Okay. I have a sister who went to Lehigh University, so I'm familiar at least a little bit with the Allentown area. And I grew up in New Jersey to, to give you all that background. And, yeah, so I should probably tell you about myself, too. So I, I grew up in New Jersey. Uh, I went to Colgate University for my undergrad uh, in New York State, and uh, from there went on to uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison for my master's and Ph.D., and uh, my Ph.D. and my master's uh, thesis was basically looking at um, uh, terrain analysis on the California coast, looking at uh, offset history on the San Andreas Fault using provenance of conglomerate classes. Um, and so I actually did a lot of geochemistry, geochronology, uh, even though it was a sedimentary basin, I'm really much more of a hard rock geologist. Um, and then since graduating, uh, and even actually a little bit overlapping with my, my end of PhD time, I, I've been teaching geology. Uh, I taught for well, I taught for a semester at Northeast Illinois University, then I did a sabbatical fill at uh, UW-Whitewater, and then a few semesters at UW-Madison, all during my PhD. I did one year at uh, Western Kentucky University right after I graduated, uh, then three year stint up at um, Lake Superior State University in um, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, right on the Canadian border. And then finally, um, seven years uh, at Lake Superior State University, and I'm currently unemployed, <laughs> looking for a job, hopefully with a geology connection. So um, that's where I am and where I come from. Would you anyway, take another I, teaching position? You know, I've thought about that. I, I certainly would. I enjoy the teaching end of things. Um, you know, the teaching positions that I've had, the two that were tenure-track positions, one basically ended up, uh, I got cut because of budgetary issues. That was like Superior State job. Um, the, um, the position here at Fort Hayes, uh, I didn't get tenure, and it was basically because I didn't publish. So, you know, I've been, I've been, well, my, my PhD research all got published, uh, but um, I haven't really gotten anything started that, that's in a publishable vein uh, since then. I've done a lot of this online activity, and, um, you know, it, it's one of those things where basically I, I, I love the teaching aspect of it. Um, I don't know that I'm ever going to get another one of these research-oriented jobs, you know, one that requires publication research. So. I've thought about uh, community college teaching, and I, I would definitely consider doing that. If I could find, you know, a, a sort of job that was looking for the teaching end of things without necessarily the research. It's not that I'm opposed to doing research. It's just that I don't want to spend my whole life writing grants, and, you know, trying to get funding for a lab. That's not my idea of why I got into the field. I, I, I want to teach, and I want to do outreach stuff, and 
so right now I, I'm looking for jobs, uh, hopefully with the, the the kind of social outreach sort of uh, uh, goal. Well, that's that's kind of my main focus right now. And Harold, welcome aboard. But guess what we're hearing? It's the chipmunk. You're chipmunking again. Sorry. Um, yeah, so would I consider another teaching job? Yeah, I would. Although I have to also be honest, you know, um, not having stuff to grade for this semester has been really wonderful. <laughs> so I, I love the teaching uh, part of it, but of course, you know, I don't miss the, the interminable department meetings, the uh, uh, a lot of the stuff that goes along with that. I mean, I was okay with the other stuff, but um, it's predominantly the fact that, that most of the jobs that I've been interested in have generally had a research component, and I've not uh, published since my PhD stuff. So. Uh, and, and there's unfortunately in the U.S., you know, not really that kind of college-level teaching position other than community colleges that, that don't require research. Yeah. So, uh, or if they are out there, they're, they're fewer and farther between than I realized. So, um, yeah, that's where I'm at right now. Hmm. Well, let's see. Um, we had uh, Harold come on there, and Harold, I can tell you if he tries to come back on, he should probably have an interesting background story. I know he's retired now in Canada, but uh, I'll let him tell the rest of that. But, um, trying to think if there was anything else in the news. There, there is certainly another volcanic eruption in the news. I was just seeing some some rather spectacular f photographs from Let me see if I can pull some of those up. Uh, this is the uh, eruption in Africa. Have you guys seen this one? It's a, it's a fissure-type eruption, uh, classic Hawaiian-style eruption, but uh, it's on the East African Rift Zone. It's in the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, and it's in a battle zone, um, which makes the, um, the pictures. Uh, let me find those pictures. Just a second. These are pretty spectacular if you haven't seen them. Uh, there it is. So I'm pulling up the blog that has them, and I'll, I'll have them up here in a minute. Yeah, okay. I'll try and change the size of the windows so I don't see all their advertising. Uh, but, all right, so let's see if I can share that. Give me a second here. Yeah. Are you seeing that picture there? <laughs> so this is actually in a national park in um, eastern Congo, and the national park exists primarily as a gorilla refuge. Um, but it, of course, sits on the East African Rift Zone, has these active volcanoes, and this is an eruption that started a little over a week ago, has now narrowed down to a single vent. And uh, the national park there actually has rangers that are armed here with AK-47s, as you can see, uh, basically to protect the tourists from the, the rebel groups in the region. Uh, it's, it's a very, uh, well, you've got to be a pretty hardy tourist to want to go in there uh, under those conditions. But uh, I, I thought that was a particularly remarkable picture. Um, talking about your dangerous volcanoes. Um, and then a bunch more of, of people... Uh, observing it without the, the armed guard, per se. Although, actually, you can see he's got two, two AKs over his shoulder. Um, just spectacular fountaining, the lava fountaining, and uh, they're on a, a cinder-covered plain. You can see the vegetation has been somewhat stripped of, of its leaves by some of the cinders that have come down. And I think they were talking about these fire fountains being up to uh, 200 meters Hi. Uh, this is your, your classic fissure eruption, classic Hawaiian-style fissure eruption, and not unheard of in that region, a beautiful, you know, long exposure where you get everything all smoothed out. And, uh, yeah. Wouldn't you like to have a picture of yourself like that? 
I'd kill for one of those pictures. Well, I don't know if I'd kill. So that's probably as close as you'd want to get to it while it's doing that. Uh, yeah, you know, I, and that's that's sort of a volcano. Well, it's pretty approachable if you're aware of the conditions. So in Hawaii, I'm sure the rangers wouldn't particularly let you in if that was within the national park. If that were happening outside of the national park, the rangers probably wouldn't be able to prevent you from getting that close. Um, and the fact is, as long as you stay upwind of those things and you keep a relatively clear escape route, that's a relatively safe thing to do. The problem in that sort of situation is if you're, if you're much closer than that and the wind changes, you could be dead very quickly yeah. um, and, and rather entombed in a more permanent way. Uh, this is the area of Africa where um, in 1977, um, I think it was Nyira Gongo, had a, a crater lake in the summit uh, that um, an earthquake opened up a fissure down the flank and that crater lake drained more or less catastrophically down this fissure and out into a surface lava flow. And because you had so much high temperature lava at, at low viscosities moving rapidly downhill, uh, the, the lava flows actually caught people and elephants alive. And in fact, there are some elephant molds where basically as the elephant was fleeing from the lava flow, the lava flow overtook the elephant the elephant would have died upon you know contact with this thing, um, but the elephant being basically a large amount of water uh, was sufficient to cool the lava immediately as it contacted the elephant's body, and that formed a chill margin very much like you see with lava trees. If you ever seen pictures of lava trees, which are also mostly water, so um, the rest of the lava flowed out around this chilled margin. The elephant died, decayed, and we actually find, you can go to East Africa and find these things where there's basically the elephant impression in the lava flow with just a, a bunch of bones left in the bottom, which are the, the bones of the elephant. Uh, presumably humans were affected in a similar way. I'm not sure if anybody's ever found a human mold in that form, but um, yeah, I mean, if an elephant can't outrun it. Um, so anyway, there are definitely dangers <laughs> in a region like that. You know, another danger here is volcanic gases alone. Even if the uh, falling lava bombs don't get you, it, it's always possible uh, that the, the gases being emitted by this thing could overwhelm you. And I know uh, it's in East Africa here where you have, um, uh, there's a local name for these things. I want to say Sapuku. Um, and then basically these are areas where carbon dioxide gas fills up low-lying areas, and people, vegetation loves this stuff, you know, existing on carbon dioxide, I guess, but a person wandering into these or an animal wandering into these um, can asphyxiate very quickly. And, in fact, there are places where you have, it's very much like a tar pit, you know, one animal goes in there and asphyxiates and dies, and then a predator comes along and sees this dead animal down there and decides to try and go in and, and get a free meal out of it and ends up asphyxiating and dying, and pretty soon you've got um, one after another of, of dead animals in there. Um, anyway, I don't know that there's any particular danger of that there, but um, pretty exciting pictures. Do we, do we know what sort of distance they were from that eruption? Um, I would imagine probably they kept a relatively safe distance, and I would say a kilometer or so. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm I'm only guessing there. Um, it's a little hard to tell because up close to the eruption, that that last picture that I had up there, um, most of the vegetation in the foreground has been completely stripped of its leaves, and so it's really hard to get a good sense of scale between there and the um, the erupting vent. Uh, yeah, I also don't know exactly how high that vent is. Um, you know, how close could you get? You could probably get up to within 100 or 200 meters of it before you'd be in real dire peril. 
but um, it, it depends on the style of the eruption that day and, and exactly what's going on. Um, you know, I've been up close to a lava flow in Hawaii, but it was it was nothing like that sort of fountaining lava. It was just a very uh, calm, placid, slow-moving lava flow. And, um, you know, those are very approachable. I mean, approachable enough that you can go up and stick your boot in it uh, if you're <laughs> careful about that. Don't burn the soles of your boot off because uh, I had to hike in to get there. But, you know... Um, I, I've actually got, it's not here in the room, but uh, I've got, you know, lava that I stuck my hammer into the active flow and pulled out a bunch and let it cool on the tip of the hammer and then pulled it off and carried it home. So, um, they can be approachable. you got to be careful. I mean, the radiant heat that you feel coming off of one of these things, that's pretty hot stuff. Uh, it can be, you know, um, well what is it, 1,200 degrees Celsius, almost 2,000 Fahrenheit for basaltic lava flow. And uh, even with the wind blowing from behind you, blowing most of the heat away from you, uh, they can be pretty hard to approach. I know that when with the Hawaiian lava flow that I've been up close to, we had really ideal conditions for it. And um, I don't have that picture handy. I'd love to show it to you. But basically just moving into to photograph it from about 5 or 10 feet uh, you felt the intense heat, and you could stay there for a few seconds, and then you wanted to get out away from it. <laughs> I just wanted to tell everybody smiling in front of the lava flow. Everybody was saying, "Shoot the picture! Shoot the picture! We got to get out of here." <laughs> Would um, pyroclastic flow be an issue with that kind of eruption? Um, generally, no. Um, and and really, more specifically, not at that stage of that eruption. Um, at least in an environment like Hawaii or, or, or like this um, uh, eastern Congo region, what would be a potential explosive situation there is if you had a significant water source, either groundwater or uh, a water body like a lake or a river, where the lava got into that and then could explosively yeah, it uh, expand. But, but that style of uh, lava fountaining is uh, is classic. It's a low viscosity lava. That means it flows relatively easily, moves relatively fast. Although most of those lava flows, you can walk away from at the speed that they flow. Um, but the thing about the reason that it's able to flow so easily, it also releases the gas fairly efficiently. Yeah. And, and those really high lava fountains, you know, there's a lot of gas being released. That's what's driving that eruption. Uh, but that's really just in that narrow vent area. And once the once the uh, gas is released from that, as it as it moves away from the vent, uh, I mean, there's still some dissolved gas in there, but it's not generally highly explosive. Um, on the other hand, that type of volcanic eruption can evolve with time to more explosive events. It's it's rare, but Hawaii, for example, there are two. Well, one's historic in the clearest sense of the word, and the other's a little bit older than uh, traditionally historic. In 1924, at the end of one of the um, uh, eruptions in uh, the Halimama crater, uh, as the lava began to withdraw, uh, there was groundwater that kind of flowed back into that thing, and that caused a, a large explosion. Um, and that blasted rocks out of there up to, I don't know, um, quarter of a mile away, a mile away. I'm not sure exactly what distance and size of rocks, but ballistics that, that would potentially... In fact, I think one person was killed in the 1924 eruption. I know yeah. in 1790, and this is one that's pre-written history in Hawaii, but is definitely part of the oral traditions, uh, there was a similar um, explosive event uh, in, the, in the event region that killed a number of Hawaiian warriors. Uh, it actually changed the course of Hawaiian history because these warriors were off on a war mission and they got killed by this volcanic explosion. And I don't know, it, it, it changed the whole... I, I don't know the full story behind that, but it, it's an interesting one. So I, I would expect, you know, activity in this region would probably continue if it follows the Hawaiian story model. Usually you start with a fissure eruption long dike breaking to the surface, lava coming up through the entire region, 
whole line of fire fountains. That usually narrows down to a single vent over time, or maybe two vents. Uh, it seems like the eruption here in, in East Africa is down to a single vent at this point. Uh, and then that vent can, can go on, depending on the lava supply, for you know, hours or weeks or years. And you know, the modern eruption of Puuro'o in Hawaii started over 25 years ago and is still on basically with some minor variations over time. But uh, pretty much from that same vent that it, it narrowed down to 25 plus years ago. So, um, my guess in a system like this, probably it lasts for a couple of weeks and then um, shuts down. That's certainly what the majority of Hawaiian eruptions have been like, uh, just from the historical record. Right. Harold, we were doing a game of uh, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself, just to. Um, uh, I'm oh no, you're still chipmunking. All right. Well, you can do it this way. We're recording. It might be entertaining. <laughs> Sorry about that. We've had that issue, and I don't know exactly what caused it, but. Um, Sometimes he, he drops off and then comes back right on, and it works just fine. But, uh, yeah, Lake Kivu. Uh, who's who's saying that, Brian? Yes. Yeah, Lake Kivu. So I mean, yeah, the CO two. You're right. Catherine was putting that in there. Yeah, the CO two um, threat is is another one, and and those two are both um, good examples of that potential for disastrous overturn. Oh, Jim's already gone. Sorry. Thank you, Jim, for coming. Well, the CO2 reminds me of something, and I'm, I'm sure Rush Limbaugh is not where I should be getting my um, climate science facts from, but he claims that more CO2 was released in the eruption of Mount Pinatubo than human beings have placed in the atmosphere since the beginning of time. And I find that hard yeah. to believe. Yeah, well, that's just outright wrong. Um, I thought volcanoes actually were more responsible for cooling, both from the well, okay. and so, yeah, yeah. Okay, other so, gases. So, let me, uh, great, great topic, and, and I'll tell you what I understand about this and, um, in a couple of different ways. So the Pinatubo eruption is one I'm fairly familiar with, not having done a great amount of study, but, but certainly... I, I paid a lot of attention to that one. I used to teach about that one in particular. Um, as far as CO2, human versus anthro, uh, there's anthropogenic CO2 uh, burned by humans versus um, what's been put out through volcanoes. The U.S. Geological Survey has an estimate on that that shows that it's, it's something like 100 times that, that, that CO2 produced naturally is on the order of 100 times annually what the, um, sorry, let me get that correct. It's anthropogenic CO2 is about 100 times what the natural CO2 emissions are from volcanoes on a global basis. There's some uncertainty there because mid-ocean ridge uh, eruptions that are submarine are hard to quantify, right. uh, but there's also a real thought that they actually don't matter so much because that CO2 probably goes into seawater and not directly into the atmosphere. Um, so how am I doing now? You're sounding much better, Harold. Oh, good. <laughs> and, and I've just launched into an answer on another question, which uh, so, so we'll definitely bring you in for um, yes. more about yourself in a minute, but let me just try and okay. attempt to answer this one. Um, so, so that's the general thing. Now, a big eruption like a Pinatubo, which is, you know, certainly a large eruption of its type in probably 80 years, is obviously going to be a very large producer of CO2 as volcanic eruptions go. So, obviously, it dominated the CO2 output among volcanoes. Like Actually, I'm not 100% sure that even that is the case because Hudson in, in the um, South American Andes uh, also erupted that year. It didn't get nearly as much press, but actually put out uh, 
fair amount of CO2 and presumably, or SO2 and presumably CO2. So just to get to the other part of your question, you know, don't they actually cause cooling? The answer is particularly Pinatubo style eruptions with the large plenty eruption column that puts gases up into the high stratosphere. That puts a lot of aerosols up there. And those aerosols are basically fine particles of ash and also volcanic gases, particularly sulfur dioxide. And the sulfur dioxide, as it gets into the high atmosphere, it reacts with water and becomes sulfuric acid. And uh, certainly that absorbs a certain amount of solar radiation. And so it actually has a cooling effect on the surface of the Earth. And in fact, um, it's been suggested that um, one of these uh, geoengineering solutions for possibly dealing with climate change is the idea of basically uh, taking some high altitude uh, aircraft and putting out a fine spray of, of sulfur dioxide or something like that. Um, and it would certainly have the effect of cooling down the atmosphere. On the other hand, <coughs> there are other potentially negative side effects that, that you know you could have as well. And, yeah, also, Canada wouldn't like it very much. Yeah, yeah. Not every, <laughs> Acid rain. That, the other problem with that is, yeah, it doesn't necessarily affect And we like the warmth. <laughs> so um, who would make a decision to do that? Because it's kind of a global uh, climate you're affecting, although it might affect different local climates differently. So it's, um, it's a political hot potato to try and deal with that. But... Um, Anyway, that, that, that's, the, that's the basic answer to that. You know, those, those Rush Limbaugh sort of bits of science are worth talking about, really worth talking about in a situation like this because, I mean, Rush clearly does not have a scientific background. He's drawing on, hopefully, people that have scientific background, but not necessarily. And... Um, Certainly, if you've got a question about that, I'm sure there are other people that have questions about that. And, you know, I'm not a climate scientist by training, but I, I certainly have been a keen watcher of climate science right. and have gotten most of my information directly from scientific studies. So, you know, that's, that's where I'll qualify myself. So, Harold, tell us about yourself, and then we'll, we'll yes. come back up to... Um, Ahmad, uh, once Harold's done, and just tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and uh, this is much for everybody else's. Yes, and for your uh, Hollywood production. <laughs> well, you can think of it that way too. So yes, feel free to inflate your resume in such a way that you won't get caught. Yes, well, it doesn't <laughs> doesn't do me any good, but uh, I was with a big corporation, a <clears throat> certain Ontario utility, does Which nuclear plants, nameless. nameless. <laughs> As after five years, I'm finally healed, but uh, <laughs> I was retired, uh, mainly geophysics in my uh, master's and uh, graduate, and I did rock mechanics uh, stress. So I've been applying rock mechanics to earthquakes, and uh, in my several years of blogging now on my big blog, I've uh, actually gone more to, you know, earthquakes and the sources of earthquakes and the cause of earthquakes and this this fracking and deep injection thing is just so fascinating for me it's my uh, most favorite topic so uh, uh, that's about it I had uh, I consider myself more of a scientist because I I did direct a lot of money when I was in the uh, utility to science so. mm -hmm. yeah your blog is Ontario Geofish. Was yeah. it dot com or? Ontar uh, it's Blogspot. It's uh, Ontario okay. Geofish, but it's you know you either look up my name Harold Asmus or Ontario Geofish. It shows up. What is the Geofish reference in in relation to? I get the Ontario. Well, I I started it mostly combining a fishing blog. And geofishing. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I talk mostly about fishing at the at the uh, cottage on the dock and stuff like that because I was just retired, so I thought I would uh, do more fishing. But since uh, yeah, I always thought I would actually eventually come back to some work, but you know they totally screwed up any nuclear resurgence in Ontario, so well, uh, yeah. I can't do it. 
So yeah. we'll uh, we'll have to wait for uh, for that. And it looks like we just lost a mod, so mm-hmm. <laughs> we can't ask him to tell us about himself. Um, but that's the way it goes. Well, Harold, I see you're commenting on the earthquake that's here in my backyard. I can't believe they built North Anna as close to a fault as they did. There's well, nobody knew that uh, here. Apparently, they knew it was an earthquake zone, but it, they hushed it all up because they were a billion bucks into building the thing in the mid '70s, and here we go. I mean, the epicenter well, was was just a few miles away from that plant. Yeah, but you can't not build near a fault dump. <laughs> there, they're all hidden. <laughs> Okay. All the faults are hidden, and you never know they're really a fault until after the fact, because deeper down, it's it's all the uh, it's all the Precambrian, and you certainly know uh, if you come up to here and uh, Kakabeka Falls, or you take Ron's pictures, and you look at all our Precambrian and all our stuff, it's just tons of faults, and that's what uh, is underneath all of Virginia and all those other places. They've got this Appalachian junk on top, but. But the, the real earthquakes are down in the granites. It's not in the Appalachian sediments. So you got to look at the uh, basement uh, structure. And that's the thing that nobody does with this. When they talk about their faults, they're usually talking about their upper Paleozoic oil-bearing faults and stuff like okay. that. But the real earthquakes are in the, are in the uh, granites. So. I, I should say, uh, Doak, that um, if you think they're... they're poor in their selection of siting there in Virginia. Um, you got to remember that there was a, I don't know if it was Pacific Electric and Gas, but one of the uh, California power companies uh, once tried to set up a, a nuclear power plant at Bodega Bay, Bodega Head, which was about a mile away from the San Andreas Fault. And in fact, the reactor hole, the, they got so far as to excavate the, the base where the, where the reactor core was going to go. Uh, it actually sits within 100 yards or so of an older strand of the San Andreas Fault, which, while probably not active in the modern day, has the potential for reactivation, and certainly it's on a very active plate boundary. That one was actually, there were lots of protests when they when they tried to do that, and that one was actually successfully, um, they convinced the developers to go put it elsewhere. But um, you know, power plants—they're—they're—they're—they're they're, they're, they're generally not thinking earthquakes first. They're thinking about well, where can we get cooling water, where can we get yeah, and, uh, and, and uh, dams too. The deep water is all at faults, right? The, yeah. uh, they're they're yeah. the best place to build anything. <laughs> and and don't forget, yeah. in California, everything's so emphasized on a fault. We found a strand. We found this and that. But in reality, every square—I don't think you could throw a stone and not hit a fault in California. They're, it's very hip. So every time they find it, and who knows whether that means anything. In the east, uh, again, uh, there's faults everywhere, and uh, who knows that uh, they're actually uh, uh, going to mean anything. Like, uh, our nuclear plants are supposedly on a fault. Technically, they are. The Precambrian faults, like, they're just, uh, they're everywhere. The very first earthquake I ever felt was on the Ramapo Fault growing up in New Jersey, and if you project the Ramapo Fault across the Tappan Zee, the Hudson River, uh, it projects directly toward the Indian Point nuclear power plant, in, you know, just north of New York City. It's, it's, it's one of these plants that was built there with, well, you know, clearly a great location to serve New York City, but again, the geology is... You know, not the yeah, and, and that's where the deep water is usually. If you ever look our lakes up up here, it's if you have a really deep lake trout lake, good for fishing, it's on a fault. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. and, and the whole Hudson River down there, it's all a big fault. And uh, it's a failed uh, Lake Champlain. They're all failed uh, Malacca gens and uh, the faults. And uh, most, uh, well, I think the like, trouble with the states is that Every state, every individual state has a geological survey, and they've all called their faults differently. But there are these huge through-going faults that no one really has identified that are probably worse than the others. And the Virginia one and Oklahoma, they're all on those things. So I call them, in Ontario, we actually uh, did reflection seismic, and they, they're giant uh, megathrusts of the uh, ancient Precambrian. 
Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I see we've got two new new uh, participants here. So, oh. Chris, you want to introduce your your new uh, participant there? Yeah, this is my youngest here, Autumn. She should be fast asleep, seeing as it's ten past eleven at night here. Mm. Well, she decided oh, yeah. that she wanted to come and join in the hangout. <laughs> well, we like to recruit our geologists young, so. Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> it, start them young. <laughs> And you will get a rack to show her. <laughs> yeah, that's right. She gets a nice lump of coal in her stocking or yes, whatever. Yes, she love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, nothing wrong with that. That's valuable right, now. That's a good gift for a geologist. <laughs> Do you know we did a, a little uh, introduction round earlier. If you want to, uh, just introduce yourself uh, a little bit about yourself, where you are, and what your background is with geology or uh, if you're feeling self-conscious, you don't have to. But <laughs> I'm Gina Rodkey. I'm from Pennsylvania. I just find it fascinating. Um, I don't have any professional experience with geology. It's just something I enjoy following myself. Mm -hmm. uh, what part of Pennsylvania can we inquire generally? Um, the southeastern, just outside okay. of Philadelphia. Okay. Uh, we had uh, another participant earlier on who was up from Allentown area, and I was mentioning that I had a sister who went to Lehigh University. I had another sister who went to Shippensburg University, so nice. that area of Pennsylvania is not entirely unfamiliar to me. Beautiful area. Yes, it is. It is. We used to run uh, earthquake conferences all through that area when I used to when they used to pay me and. Uh, we always would uh, be touring through all Pennsylvania, all that place, and you couldn't help run into a university town. And yeah. always that weekend in October, and they're all having a stupid homecoming. So it was yeah. a tremendous tragedy to us <laughs> when we suddenly <laughs> warm into a town where we thought we'd get a hotel, <laughs> and it was uh, nothing but homecoming things. Oh. Yeah. You just you just have to crash in front of a fraternity and you know and <laughs> with them and join the party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Homecoming is another word for free beer. <laughs> well, uh, Gina, do you have any questions that you want to ask us? Because uh, we've been going for about an hour and a quarter, and I'm, I'm going to... Oh, go you're this. over time. You're starting at 5 o'clock right. my time. So, okay. No, no, no questions. I added a picture of Pennsylvania garnets to your picture. Is, okay, I just saw one come up there. I didn't it see who it was. It's not as good as your picture, but these are Pennsylvania garnets. Excellent. From Excellent. my area. And, and they are lovely looking garnets, and I would love to... Now, now, is that rock from... That's your local bedrock there, or is that uh, a piece that got... Well, you're south of the glaciated zone, so you, that's got to be a local rock. It is. Right? It's a local rock. That's, there that's are garnet rock. mines around here, around this area, and sometimes when you go through streams and fields and stuff, if you know what you're looking for, you can find some fun stuff. Yeah. In fact, that rock unit is very likely uh, very similar in its, um, in its history, I would guess, uh, to the southern Vermont area. The gas at Schiston in Vermont would be in a very similar uh, position in the Appalachian origin uh, uh, compared to your area. Got and it. So it wouldn't surprise me if those rocks are actually um, genetically related if, if separated by a long distance. Right, right. Um, cool. So, yeah, I'd, I'd love to. I haven't actually collected too many rocks with those kinds of nice big garnets and schist. Mm. Um, next time I'm back east, I'll have to. <laughs> ask you for a locality there. <laughs> but it's, it's a lovely looking rock and, and, and I'm sure you. if you made a nice cut through that it would look pretty exciting. <laughs> is that yeah, picked out of a, um, a road cut or is that picked out of a uh, quarry or? It's actually a quarry. Okay. Yeah. Good place to go look for rocks. Yeah. Yeah. If you can get into them. <laughs> <laughs> because, uh... Some of yeah. them you're not allowed. They're yeah. closed. Yes. 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 And, and with liability concerns these reason. days, it can be harder and harder to get into these places. Right, right. So. 
Okay, well, if you guys, you know, are, are, are wrapping up, you know. Maybe you, Autumn. Trying... Autumn, have you got a question for us? Have you got a question? <laughs> yes? No? <laughs> no? What are all these no. people doing here? <laughs> Why is the computer talking to me? <laughs> well, yeah, she probably gets more sense out of the computer than she does out of me. Yeah. <laughs> we aims to please. <laughs> Very good. Well, so it's that exciting with uh, no earthquakes the last few days. It was, uh, I'm waiting for more earthquakes. <laughs> I wasn't even going to join because there wasn't any earthquakes this last <laughs> week. No big ones, but actually I saw a picture posted on Twitter today. Um, there was actually surface rupture in that uh, Oklahoma quake last week. Some of the oh, geophysicists really? who were going in and, and yeah, putting in seismometers uh, found some surface rupture from it. It's um, it basically looks just like a little um, it has to be gap secondary. in the surface of a room. Yeah, that's I mean, probably it was, secondary. It was, clearly, it, was, it was clearly an offset. That's a recent uh, thing presumably associated with the quake. I mean, there, there were a few houses that were pretty well damaged right in the epicentral region for that one, so it's probably not a real surprise that there was some ground offset. Yeah. Are you yeah. familiar with any other eastern U.S. earthquakes that have produced ground offset um, in the recent historic record? Because obviously there are big ones like the New Madrid quake and Charleston probably had some, but can you think of any recent quakes that have produced surface offset? Uh, well, Eastern U.S. Mostly, they produce a surface uh, disruption of some sort, liquefaction. I think the Shikudumi uh, earthquake yeah. had some uh, liquefaction. Uh, they'll always they they'll they might produce a secondary effect, like where the rock is highly stressed. They might produce another pop up, or where. Uh, you know, there's a landslide or something. They definitely trigger landslides. And, yes, uh, that. So there's usually, yeah. and, and don't forget that area being so disrupted with pumping out oils and stuff, and that yeah. any earthquake would would probably accelerate a regular cracking. Right? So uh, these things are always interesting if they're if they're one shot deals or whether they're a, a mechanism that will go on. Right. right. So, because basically they are caused by being high, the ground is highly stressed. Mm -hmm. This whole area is very highly stressed. So that's a relief of, a release of stress. Mm -hmm. So uh, the trouble is a lot of these, uh, these guys are saying, well, New Madrid and stuff, there's no GPS motion. So the, uh, there isn't an accumulation of strain showing up. And so therefore they can't exist. These earthquakes are impossible. Or there's no more earthquakes coming out of uh, New Madrid. But they're wrong. They are a, a relief of, of stress. They're the absolute opposite to the San Andreas uh, buildup of stress. Of strain. So uh, they will continue as soon as you do anything that upsets the equilibrium and, uh, or naturally. And they'll release that stress. So liquefaction is a big thing, and then brickwork is always going to happen. And anybody that's on a, a swamp or, or a really soft soil will have a huge amplification, and yeah. that will be damaged. But I'm interested that that nuclear reactor is starting next week or something. It's, that was a huge long time for the beginning out. So. <laughs> so let me make sure I understand you. You're saying that Lake Anna itself? May have been part of what yeah, caused the stress. Yeah. The walk, the because I guess they did dam up Lake Anna when they built the uh, power plant. Yeah, but don't forget. I mean, it's the same. It's not the hydro fracking that does anything usually. It's it's the injection of large amounts of water over a long time. Okay. Uh, these thing these systems are tremendously sensitive because they are very highly stressed. But if you left them alone, it might be another thousand years or two thousand years before they would just go off on their own. They've shown to be very, very sensitive to a few bars or a few atmospheres of a, of a pressure change or water. Um, and where there is water along these big megathrusts, that's where all the earthquakes are, like the end of Lake Ontario or 
Now, Cleveland area, just uh, below Lake Erie, they've been injecting forever, and they've had some uh, big earthquakes. So uh, if you add water, see, basically these faults are highly stressed and water starved. If you add water to any of these things by a lot of deep injection, uh, they will go. Earl, have you got a, a more circle diagram that you could uh, pull up real quickly? Uh, no. <laughs> okay. I, I asked, the reason I asked that, Doug, if you're, if you're taking a structural geology class and you're talking about stress and strain, the more circle diagram is generally the one that's used to illustrate the effect of adding a little bit of uh, moisture or a little water pressure is really what it is. Uh, and, and it's very clear. What's that? M-O-H-R. M-O-H-R circle. And it's, it's not something, uh, as, a, as a lay person interested in this, I'm not sure it's necessarily going to make a lot of sense to you right off the bat, oh. but you'll probably, find, you'll probably find some stuff out there. Uh, it's, it's been too long since I've had structural geology for me to try and explain it to you. But that is, that is the central diagram that illustrates the effect of increased water pressure and, and is usually used in association with these explanations. So if you want to do some more research on it. Yeah, it looks complicated. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, I well, just see. It gets into <laughs> stress tensors and things like that, which is where the math begins to turn me off. But, um, you know, if, if you're interested in the subject, it's certainly uh, something. This is where I'd really love to say, you know, have a structural geologist handy that we can call up and say, hey, explain the more circle to us because I could certainly use the refresher course on it. I mean, I know the general principle, but the actual explanation with yeah, exactly how it... Uh, yeah, well, here's the... Uh, this is me. <laughs> this is like a more circle, but... Uh, uh, Basically, anything in the ground or the rock, if you increase your difference between your two normal stresses, like you have a very high one direction, if you're both equal the same, then that circle goes down to zero, and that's an ISO um, metric, yeah. or that's a that's, stress. That's, and if you increase that difference, uh, then you hit this line here, which is a, the failure line usually. Exactly. I think. So... Yeah. Um, uh, so increasing the water pressure causes the circle to grow larger yeah. without necessarily changing the, the base stresses. And so it gotcha. will tend to cause you to intersect that failure line, which is triggering an earthquake, essentially. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, increasing uh, a little bit of water pressure decreases the actual uh, stress, normal stress on the, on, on the uh, face. And, the trick here uh, is really understanding the stresses, too, because that, that's really a critical part of explaining this. I, I, I would just say, you know, if you're going to try and understand that fully, go read up on the, on the whole stress regime, because that, that actually, that's the thing that's hardest to quantify in the first place. How do you, you know, how do you know exactly what those stresses are? And right. That's your area of expertise, Harold. So yeah, so what happens is, is in San Andreas or whatever, we've got deep shifting and it slowly moves. So one of those uh, uh, stresses is, is moving, they're moving apart and the circle gets bigger until such time that it will intersect or, or, or crack the, but it will move. Whereas here in the east we have this big high stress and we're very close to the failure, uh, to that failure line. And then uh, just the tiniest disturbance of, of a bit of extra water will bring that earthquake. So all down the mega thrusts, which are big, huge lines down the east here, uh, they're all water starved. So you'll notice that where there's lots of water, like New Madrid or some other areas, uh, you do get, when the water intersects these zones, you'll get a lot of activity. And um, but along that line, there's perfectly dry areas where you'll get no activity. Um, when you say there's a lot of stress built up here in the east, that um, where does that stress come from? Because traditionally in plate tectonics, the stress is concentrated along the plate boundaries. I mean, yes. obviously there is residual stress in, in plate interiors, but where spe I, clearly isostatic adjustments are one of those things that causes this. So as the ice sheets retreat, and there's weight removed from a portion of the crust, you're going to have stresses redistributing. 
that's clearly one of the sources of, of stress here. What else causes stress in a plate interior? Well, basically, we have found whenever we dig a quarry in the high stress or uh, near near the very high stress points, is that this whole area is near failure on the stress, and that's causing by the uh, passive margin about movement. Either, as Zoback would think, the drag of the uh, plates are causing over this stress, or what I think is being on a sphere. This uh, we're just settling down on a sphere, like putting your big thumb on a on a beach ball, and uh, we've settled down over cold areas, and the whole thing has stressed up to the max. So we're lucky we had some glaciation here and stuff that sort of relieved that, but uh, either both by theory and measurements, the Cambrian is very highly stressed. We, we did drilling and um, our own hydrofracking, which was actually for stress measurements of deep granites. They're very highly stressed. So our rock, like my Niagara Tunnel that I go on and on about, it's in a zone of extremely high stresses. And if you want to read all sorts of trouble of trying to excavate in high stresses, then uh, that's the story. <laughs> but uh, I tell no, you what, I, right. very high. No, no, I was just going to say, I, I, I for one, um, don't want to read about high stress. I want to watch. No, no, no. I'm just saying it. No, no, I, I, very high. I, you don't I, read about it. I was about to make a smooth exit there, but yeah. <laughs> it didn't didn't turn out quite as smooth. All right, um, but it's no, it's I gotta, get, gotta get some dinner before I, I watch the package. Yeah. Okay. Well, you don't want to be highly stressed about it. No. <laughs> I, but you guys are more than welcome to continue this. Um, oh, I'm going to drop out. But the, the the chat can go on without me. So no, yeah. it's is yours. We can't yeah, go out. I'm yeah, gonna, you've off. got the troll button. No. <laughs> <laughs> you've got the no, com. Dinner chat. Good night, everyone. Uh, yeah, it's good night. My Bye. Leave. And we haven't had a troll Bye. to test it on. But my yeah. understanding is that um, everybody has the troll button, and it's just the first person that uses it. Uh, Signals You're right. It, it, it actually shows up over all your little heads. You're right. Okay. Yeah. So, but I, I think actually that um, you guys could go on and continue this conversation without me. Uh, as soon as I shut down, it, it does continue no, no. for you. We, guys. we don't want to so lose our, our comedy relief. No. <laughs> <laughs> so it's up to going. you. I just right. want to make sure that you yeah, know. Yeah. That you Goodbye. Have to I'm the first to go. Here I go. Ah! I'll see you all on uh, Thursday, perhaps. Uh, and um, meanwhile, have yourself a nice day. You too. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, 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 yeah